So today I'm going to be talking about the Boston Massacre. Just a bit of background, uh, this uh, was a I mean, bit of background, a quick summary before I get into it. Um, this was a deadly riot that occurred, uh, occurred on March 5th, um, 1770 on, in King Street, which is in Boston, obviously. <laughs> well, it did begin between American colonists and British soldiers, but ended up being a bloody slaughter. And um, this really energized this anti-British sentiment and really started the move toward the American Revolution. This was five years before the revolution actually started, but it marked the first act of violence against it. It wasn't the first thing that made um, Americans unhappy, but it was the first thing that really sparked any, any kind of violence. Well, like I said, this wasn't the first thing that made people, especially like, people in general, unhappy with the British, but also people in Boston. Well, more than 2,000 British uh, soldiers had occupied the city. Now, there were 16,000 colonists in Boston, but now came 2,000 uh, British troops, which um, tried to <laughs> enforce tax laws, like the infamous Stamp Act or the Township Act. Well, the colonists said, hey, um, no, these taxes are repressive and they uh, did a cry called no taxation, no taxation without representation because they obviously couldn't debate these taxes. They couldn't approve them. They couldn't, they, they couldn't say that they didn't like them. And yeah, like, just the number of British soldiers compared to the number of colonists is quite... In 2,000 soldiers for 16,000 colonists, I mean, that's a bit overboard by the British. They're civilized people. They don't have to have that much control like, over them. Well, um, colonists and soldiers, well, they didn't get along well, as you can probably guess. And um, these conflicts between them, not actual conflicts, but skirmishes, they were, they were gradually more common. The people were beginning to get fed up. And um, the way they did this was vandalizing stores selling British goods. So if you sold anything that was British, your store could be vandalized. Um, and if you were a merchant, like selling st stuff that's British, you would be intimidated. And if you, even, if you were even caught buying British goods, you would also be intimidated <laughs> because if you bought British goods, you would be helping the British, and that's not that you would be paying British taxes. If you just bought American made goods, well, the British didn't benefit as much. They did benefit some, but not as much. Well, on February 22nd, just a few days, a few days before the um, Boston Massacre, uh, there's this known loyalist store that was in Boston, and a group of patriots, that's what the colonists who were extremely anti-British are called patriots. Well, they attacked this this loyalist store. Um, a customs officer called Ebenezer Richardson, who uh, lived near the store and tried to break break up the the crowd by because um, they were throwing rocks and stuff. So he got his gun and um, tried to fire it through the window of his own home. This did not go well because you, I mean, gun violence never ends up well because uh, he actually missed and shot um, an 11 year old boy named Christopher Cedar. He, he died. And the Patriots, um, this, like, they got even more enraged because now a young boy had been killed in a struggle against the British. Not a struggle, but a protest against the British by a British loyalist. Loyalists were the name for those who sympathized with the British and who defended them. Well, a few days later, on the 5th of March, 1770, it was snowy. Well, on the evening, Private Hugh White was, was the only soldier guarding the, the king's money, which was uh, stored in the custom house on King Street. Well, um, some colonists ended up joining him and, well, threatening him uh, with violence. Because, I mean, it was king's money, so it was money from the colonists. 
And the colonists were fed up. They said, hey, um, give us our money back because we don't deserve to be taxed. Well, White decided to fight back after being annoyed. He didn't fight back at first, but after constant harassing, he uh, struck someone with his bayonet. Well, the colonists, in response, they decided to get some, stone, some um, snowballs and throwing them at him. These snowballs quickly turned to ice and quickly turned to stones. So, as you can see, the colonists really like to throw stones. Um, well, uh, bells started ringing throughout the town, which are usually a sign of fire. And this attracted more male colonists into the streets. Well, this assault like, was an assault on White, who was being harassed, like being thrown ice, snow, stones, and then were more and more people coming into this the street. So he had to call for backup. He had to call for for assistance, for reinforcement. Well, um, Captain Thomas Preston uh, heard this, and because of this plea and this um, fear for any mass riots and even the loss of the king's money, which they had to, to give back to, to Britain. Well, he arrived on the scene with soldiers and got in front of the custom house and took up a defensive position. Well, um, some colonists did think and said, hey, um, if we keep doing this, uh, there's going to be bloodshed and we don't want that. So they said to the, to the um, soldiers to with their guns, please don't shoot. Um, please don't shoot, we don't want any bloodshed here. Others said, hey, shoot at us. So the, the soldiers were like, who should, should we shoot? Should we not shoot? They were waiting for a command because they literally did not know what to do. Well, um, Preston said that um, Carlos even told the told him um, the protesters were planning to carry off White uh, and um, possibly, although he didn't state this, possibly murder him. So um, it was, the chances were quite high. Um, and if I may quote George Washington, the plot thickens. Um, <laughs> Well, violence started escalating. Um, colonists started, instead of throwing snow and ice and stones, they started throwing clubs and sticks. So even more, more violent sticks and stones. Well, yeah. um, some say um, there's this debate because someone had to shoot first for this massacre to occur. Now, it was obviously the soldiers who shot first because they were the only ones with guns. But uh, someone said, uh, reportedly said the word fire. Now, this caused the soldier to fire his gun and shoot. It's debated whether, first of all, this fire was said by, by someone in the crowd, by a colonist, or by the commander, by Thomas, um, Thomas Preston. It's also debated if this shot was intentional or if it just escaped. So that comes into play a little bit later on. Well, the, as soon as the first shot was heard, the other soldiers started shooting. Now, five, five colonists were killed, including um, Crispus Atticus, uh, no, Crispus Attax, sorry, who was a local dock worker of mixed racial heritage, and six were wounded. Um, some like, among the casualties was Sam, um, Samuel Gray, this rope maker who was left with, you know, on the side of his head, a hole the size of his fist. So, yes, yes. Um, well, sailor James Caldwell was hit twice before dying, and Samuel Maverick and Patrick Carr were mortally wounded. Now, yes, I know. Boston Massacre suggests many more people died, and although five people, only five people died, it's still a massacre. It's still people with guns shooting at, against at people without guns. It's still considered a massacre, and also, if you want to go down this route, you can see that the colonists who ended up winning the war, 
would use this word massacre as anti-British propaganda. So you can say that it, it wasn't a massacre because it, it was a massacre because even though only five people were killed, five people were killed. But it also can be debated as to like the word massacre being anti-British propaganda. Well, um, Preston and his soldiers, they were outnumbered and were soon arrested by local colonial authorities. Well, um, and, propag and, jail, and propaganda started arising from both sides. So pro-British and anti-British. Preston um, wrote his version of the events when he was in jail, so he so we published and his side of the story would be, would be heard. Um, however, son, the Sons of Liberty, who was an independence group, with notable leaders like John Hancock and Samuel, Samuel Adams, who I think, if I'm not mistaken, is the cousin of John Adams, the famous president. This is, I mean, way before John Adams was even president. John Adams was elected president in 1796, and this is 1770, so quite, quite a bit before this. Well, the Sons of Liberty, like I said, also tried to incite um, anti-British fighting. So you can see um, Preston was um, was saying, um, this is my side of the events. I wasn't doing this on purpose. All the Sons of Liberty were like, oh, the British are trying to kill us. They're, they want all of us to die and they want to survive to pay the taxes to the British. You know, propaganda, essentially. And, well, British troops, started uh, retreating because the tensions were, were starting to really rise and they retreated from Boston to Fort William. Paul Revere, he um, encouraged anti-British attitudes. Well, he, well, the way he did this was etching out a really famous um, engraving which um, depicted British soldiers murdering American colonists. It's a really, really famous engraving. And he did this to fuel anti-British sentiment because if the people saw this, they said, oh my god, all British soldiers are out to kill us. Yeah. And like they have more hatred towards the British. It just it showed that the the British were the ones who actually started this Boston Massacre, although it was the colonies who had actually started the fight. So yeah. He also said like the soldiers were this vicious, like were these vicious men who were attacking these gentlemen colonists who were just defending themselves. They weren't doing anything wrong. I mean, entirely propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> and um well, Revere ended up having um copied this graving from this Boston artist called Henry Pullum. Wait. Now this all happened, but whilst this propaganda was spreading, like I said, the soldiers and Thomas Preston were arrested. It did take seven months to 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 bring the soldiers to the trial. Well, no one really wanted to defend these soldiers because, I mean, who would want to defend the ones who had gone against the colonists? No one in their right mind would actually do this, right? Well, one American lawyer did. And, yeah, really notable person who you probably may know, John Adams. Future President John Adams was the only person to defend the British in this Boston Massacre. His philosophy was essentially, I mean, they deserved defense. And, well, he was he was no, no fan of the British. He didn't like them either. But, like I said, he wanted the man to receive a fair trial. After all, he, I mean, he was there when the Declaration of Independence was signed. He was there when the um, U.S. Constitution. No, he wasn't there with the U.S. Constitution, but I don't think. But he was there when, I guess, he was there when the nation, with the new United States were being established. He knew that a fair trial was an essential human right. So he wanted to give this to the British. This is before the United States were, was founded, but fundamentally as a human human right, uh, he knew they deserved fair trial. Yes, they were British, but that's not their fault. I mean, well, that was his, his philosophy. Well, 
there was this debate as to whether to give Repressin and the other soldiers the death penalty. And, um, well, the colonists didn't want the British to have an excuse to even the score. So, yeah. Um, if they, yeah. Well, Adams knew that people in Boston would be extremely angry towards the, the British. And he knew that any jury that would be set up would be extremely impartial. They would obviously convict um, convict um, the, the the British. And Adams said, okay, can we have a jury? Fine. I don't I'm not requesting no jury. I'm requesting a jury of people that are not from Boston. If after all they are guilty. Everyone would suppose see that. If they're not, they won't be impartial. So it was a it was a win-win. Well, um, like I said, remember how I mentioned how it was unclear as to whether who set fire and if the shot was intentional, where that was entirely Adams' argument. He said that there was a huge um, confusion about the night, and even eyewitness testimony said that. There was contradictory evidence. Some said that they clearly saw Preston give the command. Others said that the command came from somewhere else. So the yeah, eyewitness testimony wasn't that reliable. Um, for example, uh, Richard Combs um, um, said that after the and I quote: "After the gun went off, I heard the word fire." The captain and I stood in front, about half between the breech and the muzzle of the guns. I did not know who gave the word fire. Well, Adams, like when once this was said, Adams said that there is reasonable doubt as to whether um, who set fire. So, Preston should be declared not guilty, and he was acquitted of all charges. Preston was, yeah. The other soldiers were they claimed self defense, and Adams successfully argued them out of this and acquitted them of all charges, and were not found. Um, well, no, he didn't acquit them of all charges, they were acquitted of murder. But two of them, Hugh Montgomery and Matthew Kilroy, were found um, guilty of manslaughter. And they were branded on the thumbs as first offenders per English law. So they did obey English law, saying, we're not going to do anything to you, we're just going to brand you, so you're a first, first offender. If you do this again, we can actually like do serious stuff with you, but for now, just branding you. So Adams wasn't entirely successful, but considering the death penalty was on the table and the worst the soldiers got was a branding on the thumb, and that was only for two of them, I'd say Adams was, was an amazing lawyer for this, because, I mean, he was literally the only person who wanted to defend the British. And surprisingly, the jury, like, the jury and Adams managed to get this fair trial um, even though everyone in the country hated the British, so that is quite surprising. And you have to give Adams credit for that. Adams was an amazing lawyer and an all right president. He, for the founding fathers, he's not really my favorite, but because I do have favorite um, historical figures, but Adams is not one of them. But I do like him, and you have to admire his skills as a lawyer and a man who took initiative. I mean, if he had not defended these soldiers, they would have all been killed, probably. Well, what is really the aftermath? Well, it had huge impact on British-American relations. It meant that colonists would be more, we uh, more um, weary of British rule and unfair taxation, taxation, and it's given incentives to even fight against the. Um, the British. Well, Preston, and I'm gonna quote him, so I'm gonna read off this, sorry. Um, none of them was a hero. The victims were troublemakers who got more than they deserved. The soldiers were professionals who shouldn't have panicked. The whole thing shouldn't have happened. So Preston does say, fine. There was confusion and, and we're bo both sides are to blame. Let's just leave it at that. That can stay like it is. Now, no further conflict is needed, okay? We can forget this happened and just move on with our lives. Well, this obviously did not happen because over the next five years, um, there was more rebellion. 
I mean, the Boston Tea Party, the forming of the First Continental Congress, and this defending the militia arsenal at Concord against the Redcoats. The British are, uh, they wore red coats, so that's the name they were given. And this actually, actually started the, um, the American Revolution. Now there is, there is a marker where on the intersection between Congress Street and State Street, which is where the net near um, where the sh first shots were fired, and basically to commemorate this Boston Massacre. So as you can see, the Boston Massacre was the, the first real revolutionary, I mean not the first, but the most significant, the first most significant revolutionary act against the British by the Americans. And honestly, I do think the only reason it's called Boston Massacre is because it's completely anti-British propaganda. Because the Americans won the war and they spread this and the name stuck. If the British had won, this would be called the Boston Incident, probably, but not the Boston Massacre. Before I even researched on the Boston Massacre, I, I, ha I had heard of it and I thought the around, I don't know, like 30, 40 people had died. When I heard it was five, I'm like, only five? Why is it called the Massacre? And upon thinking about it, upon doing some research, I learned that it was it was because of its completely propaganda. In my opinion, the name is propaganda. Um, if you want to see a presentation of the Boston Massacre and the aftermath with the John Adams trial, I do suggest the John Adams mini series on HBO. It's really good, amazing. Um, it does show everything: the trial, all the arguments, and it does show the rest of the Adams, the life of John Adams. But if you're only interested in the Boston Massacre, the first two or I think in the first two episodes or maybe even the third one, definitely the first two are centered on this, on his trial. So yeah, John Adams, um, he was a prominent lawyer at the time, at the time, and um, he did not make any friends after doing this. He wasn't, he wasn't hated, but. He definitely did not get any favor because he was the only, like I said, the only person actually defend the British. And yeah, that is, I mean, that is essentially the Boston Massacre and the aftermath, the trial. And yeah, that is it. Thank you for watching. Bye.